I want to take the opportunity to introduce you to uh, a relatively new friend, but already a deeply dear friend to me, and that is Stell Raven. Stell is from Labrador originally, but currently is residing in Canada's best province, New Brunswick. They are a therapist and run private practice specializing in issues relating to queer and trans identities and healing from complex trauma. I've come to know Stell as someone deeply connected to the land and with a quiet, deep wisdom that unflinchingly addresses matters of justice and healing. But like myself, Stell has been surviving COVID by keeping their fingers in the dirt, nurturing growing plants, and celebrating the long-awaited arrival of Sprunger, otherwise known as spring that immediately becomes summer in New Brunswick. Please give a Zoom welcome to Stell Raven. We're so grateful you're with us, Stell. So thank you for that lovely introduction, Wendy. I am Stell Raven. I use they, them pronouns. Um, and before I get started with this, for me, it's really important that we just take a moment and really honor the reason why we are joining and gathering today in the way that we are. Um, I think COVID has impacted all of us in different ways. Um, and some of us can't be here today. Some of us have lost our lives to a multitude of things, be it COVID or systemic racism, the impacts of systemic racism and institutionalized oppression. And I just really wanna take a moment and let's just honor, honor that fact. So today I'll be talking to you about the impacts of colonization on gender. So as Wendy mentioned, I, I am a social worker who works as a therapist. I have um, a private practice. I've been working in a, ther in a therapeutic um, way for 12 years and I've been running a private practice now for Oh, me and time, um, maybe five years. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> um, and I bring a lot to the practice that I that I do. I really focus on working with folks who um, lived with marginalized experiences, specifically um, or predominantly individuals who are indigenous, queer, trans, or two spirit. And I use the term queer as an all-encompassing term um, and trans as well as an all-encompassing term. Um, my, so my private practice does specialize working in with queer and trans health as well as healing from complex trauma. And complex trauma is generally trauma that um, originates from childhood and it also incorporates the traumas that come from experiencing um, minority stress um, and the impacts of experiencing institutionalized racism and oppression. And I also do consulting based on those, on those specialties such as speaking or workshops or um, training with other therapists and community members. On a personal note, as Wendy mentioned, I am originally from Labrador. So if you look at this PowerPoint, there, that red spot is what we refer to as Labrador. And there's a little inlet that, that goes in. And I'm from Goose Bay, which is right at the end of that place. That's um, where my father is from. That's where my father's family comes from. So my father is a nook from the south coast of Labrador. And my mother is Cree from Manitoba. 
Um, but I was raised with a lot of paradoxes. I was in my, I was not in the military. My father was in the military. So we moved a whole lot. Um, and Labrador was where we ended up going to when my father finally retired. I always heard stories of Labrador. Labrador was very much, um, I always knew that that was where that side of my family came from. I was raised with all of those stories. And then um, when I was in grade nine, I was 13 when we finally moved back um, and stayed there and I completed high school there. I left for my undergrad in social work and then I moved back um, after. And I have two children who were both born in Labrador. And then after living there for a few years after I graduated with my BSW, then I chose to leave again. And I do currently reside in New Brunswick, which is lovely, but it's not Labrador. <laughs> um, so I mentioned that I lived with a lot of paradox. So my family, there were really strong values of family and community, but it was, um, my actual family was was very regularly not a safe place to be. Um, so there were a lot of these mixed messages, but there were some really strong, beautiful core values that were given to me. Um, and some of those core values were that sense of the importance of community, the importance of interconnectedness, the fact that we are all we're all connected in, in numerous ways. That was very much instilled in me. And um, from a spiritual perspective, I was raised to be really um, quite critical of any institution or any individual that, that presented themselves as having the answers um, or presented themselves as knowing more than what you knew. So spirituality was very much, it came from the land um, and it came from that value of interconnectedness. I was raised that a church is, is just a building um, and that real spirit exists inside of all of us and inside of, and, and within the elements that are around us. Because I'm gonna be talking about um, colonization and two-spirit identity, I think it's important to give a very brief introduction of indigenous communities in Canada. I, I am from Canada, this will be, um, this, it will talk about Canada, although I'm, more, I'm aware that many of you who are joining us tonight don't um, reside in Canada. So in Canada, we have three Indigenous groups. We have Inuit, First Nations, and Métis. Indigenous is a word that encompasses all three of those groups. Inuit individuals are folks, um, it are historically from the northern um, area of Canada, although now people who are Inuk live everywhere. Um, First Nations are more what in the north we refer to as southern Canada, so the south, the southern parts of Canada. And Métis individuals are, um, there's many groups from the central parts of Canada, and Métis individuals are individuals who are Indigenous, but life was um, lived in conjunction and oftentimes families were created with individuals who were um, of European descent. Um, and all three groups, all three indigenous groups have their own distinct cultures, communities, and histories. And it's really important that not just acknowledging that not just each of these three groups have their own cultures, communities, and histories, but within these three categories, there are countless um, amount of 
communities and groups and individuals who bring their own traditions, their own ways of being, um, their own languages, their own dialects. And that's really important to honor and to recognize that we can't just paint a brush, um, all indigenous people with the same brush. With that being said, um, every single group had their own way of expressing and celebrating gender. The term two-spirit was adopted at the Indigenous Gay and Lesbian International Gathering in 1990. And what two-spirit means, it's, it's related to gender identity and or sexual orientation, but it's something beyond the Western experience of sexual orientation and gender identity. So it's neither male nor female. It's relating outside of that gender binary. Um, and a really critical element of two-spirit life is that there's a spiritual and political elements, many spiritual and political elements that are interwoven with two-spirit identity. I was speaking with um, an elder just the other day, Blue Waters, who said that um, she was told stories that before when groups were moving to different places, they would ask, where are your two-spirit people? And they would use whatever word was in their language that referred to two-spirit. And if that community um, didn't identify any two-spirit individuals within the community, they would, they would continue on. They would know that would be an indication for them that this was not the place for them to stay because two-spirit people were so integral in um, creating balance and really had so much wisdom that it was just um, understood that that was a community that maybe had more hardship um, than they wanted to commit to as far as like setting down roots in that area. I'm going to play this video here and I hope that it uh, works for everybody. So when we think about gender, this is what people assume, oh, I don't know actually if you can see my mouse, but on the left-hand side of the screen is what, um, it says what people assume gender is, and the other side says what gender actually is. I don't actually like this language because it's, it says what people assume gender is, and that's really wrong. In fact, it's this is what impacts of colonization, um, of transphobia, of um, just the gender binary that's been presented to us. This is what we've been told gender is. People are not born with an assumption that there is male or female, we are told this in many, many ways, um, formally and informally, throughout our childhood and throughout our life. But prior to colonization, gender was never pathologized. It was celebrated. And it's important, as I've already mentioned, to make sure that we don't paint all Indigenous groups with the same, with the same brush. But this is something that I have yet to come up with evidence that prior to colonization, there was an Indigenous group that ever um, would create any acts of harm against a child who was showing diversity. Um, in fact, it was, it was the opposite 
there was that awareness that there's wisdom that comes with diversity and that wisdom was celebrated and embraced. It was not tolerated. It was embraced. It was wanted. It was honored. Um, and historically, two, two spirit people were people within communities who were um, the healers within, within communities. They were recognized as having a connection with the spirit realm and a connection with this realm in ways that um, some individuals weren't able to access. And so if a hunt was going on, it was really important to have blessings or the presence of a two-spirit person. Um, during births, um, two-spirit people were used. Each community had different ways of honoring and celebrating, but it was never pathologized. So I've talked a lot about um, colonization already. And it's a term that we hear more and more, but we might not necessarily actually know what colonization is. Colonization refers to the process of settling among and establishing control over indigenous people, lands, and resources in an area. And colonization includes both the formal and informal methods, which um, it, they have impacts on behavior, um, ideological ways in which a community um, exists, there's institutional colonization and political and economical colonization. So a formal way within Canada, a formal um, way of colonization was the Indian Act, which I, in this amount of time, I, I can't give a summary of the Indian Act, but you can, you can Google it. <laughs> you can learn about it. There are books that can give you the summary, um, important elements that you need to know about the Indian Act. Um, and it was a law. It basically, it, it's a law and it impacted uh, every element of Indigenous people's lives. Informal ways of colonization include students being silenced in class um, or um, let's say you are a university student and you're presenting a paper through an Indigenous viewpoint and not getting um, the, the adequate level of, like, uh, not getting marked adequately because of that. Or um, trying to join an organization and being told that you, you don't meet dress code, that you need to cut your hair. Um, there are many forms of informal and, and formal colonization. One form of formal colonization was the act of individuals coming over and establishing their perspectives of what was, what was happening within communities. And there are two quotes that I'm going to share with you right now. The first quote is from um, a Jesuit missionary, Joseph Lafito, um, and he's speaking of the erotic and gender relations which he observed um, among indigenous folks in North America from 1711 to 1717. He was interacting with indigenous folks that are in the area that we would now refer to as California. And it says, there were women with manly courage who prided themselves upon the profession of warrior, which seems to become men alone. There were also men cowardly enough to live as women. They believe they are honored by debasing themselves to all of women's occupations. They never marry. The second quote is um, another Jesuit missionary, Pedro Font. And he was making an assessment based on his observations taken from expedition 
that was in 1775 to 1776. Um, and he was interacting with individuals that are in the area that um, we would refer to as Ontario now. Among the women, I saw men dressed like women with whom they go about regularly, never joining the men. From this, I inferred that they must be hermaphrodites, but from what I learned later, I understood that they were sodomites dedicated to nefarious practices. From all the foregoing, I conclude that there will be much to do when the holy faith and the Christian religion are established among them. When I share these quotes, I always need to just take a deep breath when I share them because they are so impactful. They represent so much more than just two quotes from two separate individuals who were exploring a new a place, a place that was new to them. In the first quote, you can so see the elements of patriarchy, um, the elements of how um, just women were, just the aspect of being a woman was enough that if you were living as a woman, it was a cowardly experience if you were a man, because clearly from his perspective, being a man was like the higher level to be. So there's so many elements of this that are interwoven. And this also shows us, this is from, seven, the first quote is from 1717, I think. Um, and it says, they believe they are honored, which is evidence to us that yes, two-spirit people existed and they weren't being disowned. They weren't being tossed to the side. They were being honored. They were being celebrated. The other piece of these two quotes that really hit home for me is that they're both from the 1700s, but we could just take that date out, shift the words a little bit, and you would have no idea that it wasn't a quote that was from this year, from someplace this year. This has become the foundation of life um, on so many levels. And as a two-spirit person trying to navigate education, um, healthcare, um, just every everyday life experiences, this becomes this um, overarching energy that is felt from many different areas. At this point, I'm often asked by individuals, um, if there wasn't a mute button and we were having a dialogue, a lot of times there's questions that come up that um, ask about, well, is there a lot of transphobia and homophobia within Indigenous communities currently? And that's a question that I can't give an easy answer to because are there experiences of homophobia and transphobia within indigenous communities? Yes, but how can we separate that experience from colonization? The fact is we can't separate that experience from colonization and our communities are, are, are impact are, are experiencing the impacts of individuals like these two people who came over and had to had to just survive our indigenous communities right now are in a state of um trying to heal while still regularly experiencing racism and oppression on all levels so it's not that sometimes individuals ask that question 
through this bias that, oh, well, almost like indigenous communities are inherently homophobic or transphobic, but that's not the truth at all. They're not, um, but there have been things that have been taught and destroyed through colonization that we are beginning to learn and heal from now. So you have a brief introduction of what two spirit identity is and a brief introduction of what colonization is. And both are very, very brief, but it's nice to know a what now, what are next steps that you can walk away with. I generally go to a place of talking about indigenizing versus decolonizing. These are two terms that again, we're hearing a lot more come up in different conversations with different um, institutions. But it's important to define the difference or identify the differences between indigenizing versus decolonizing. So indigenizing, um, and this is my take on the on these two words. So my take on indigenizing is implementing indigenous processes, indigenous ways of being, um, and more. And this is something that should be initiated and or led by indigenous folks. But decolonizing is something that's different. And decolonizing is the process of dismantling the systems that privilege Western practices. And this is where everyone has a role to play, whether you're indigenous or not, wherever you come from, whatever your lived experience is, we all have a role that we get to play in, in the process of decolonizing our, our experiences and the, and the institutions that we're interacting with and the way that we, in, decolonizing the way we engage within the world. And how can we do that? I can't go into, again, with time limits, we can't go into um, all of the ways that we can decolonize, but I am going to get into um, two different things that I see as really important within the process of decolonization. The first is critical thinking. And critical thinking is thinking about how we think. And it can seem really simple to say, think critically about this. But critical thinking, the process of colonization was actually a process of trying to eradicate critical thinking. Critical thinking is looking at different angles. We're taking those five words, the who, what, when, where, why, as well as the how, and we need to peel them apart with radical openness. This, um, this definition of critical thinking comes from Michael um, Yellowbird who wrote about critical thinking in his book for indigenous eyes only. And so when we start, when we step back and we start to really question the who's, the what's, the when's, the where's, the why's, and the how's, that can become really difficult. If we're doing it, if we're doing it well, it's hard. And the critical thinking is something that we can apply to all areas. So the critical thinking of um, who is in attendance at this presentation right now? Who's not in attendance? And why might there be some individuals who are or are not here? Um, what factors are, are contributing to that? and peeling that back further and thinking about, well, those factors, let's think about, uh, let's say somebody who wanted to attend but didn't have access to um, 
internet that things that we can we could stop there we could stop there and go well we thought critically about this maybe we're even going to try to come up with some sort of solution but then it's going even deeper of well what is it um that contributes to them not having access to this experience the radical openness is a really key piece to highlight because that's um i heard a lot of in the introductions of the folks who are connected with generous space about humility and i think that's such a critical element of radical openness is this awareness that we will make mistakes and that if we are thinking critically about things there's going to be pain there's going to be hurt um, but there's also so much potential for so much growth and healing and connection and awareness of the interconnectedness that we all have with each other and with the environment around us but it does require humility it requires respect it requires openness um, there are seven grandfather teachings um, and those i always forget one of them but there's love and respect and humility and courage and yeah, I'm not even going to try to remember <laughs> them right now, but that's what they're all required when we're approaching critical thinking with radical openness. And as I was sitting and thinking about this presentation and thinking of how unique it is that we're all coming together from so many geographical locations with so many different experiences in life. I was thinking, what is the thing that could tie us together? With all of this information, we're learning about um, gender, maybe expanding our minds of what gender can look like, understanding that gender and the way that we have all that in the way that we um, are being taught about gender right now through that binary of male and female. We're learning that that's not the way that it that it existed. Um, prior to colonization. And so really taking that role in, in decolonizing our thoughts, thinking critically about things. The last piece that I'm gonna talk about is what I refer to as the three R practice. Um, I, and the word practice doesn't necessarily fit within this realm, but it's, um, it's an approach that I've taken to therapy. And I don't know if other people are writing or talking or experiencing things in this way, but over the years in my practice as a therapist, I, I, a, a practice as a therapist, specifically working with marginalized people who are experiencing trauma, which is a, which is a place that Sometimes the textbooks just don't give you <laughs> the answers that are actually helpful for individuals when they're experiencing oppression and a trauma on a continual basis. So I have um, taken three words that all start with R and have um, put them together in what I call the three R practice. But in, for us in this approach, I think we could also call it the three R perspective. And it's connected to how we can decolonize our um, perspective of the world. And this three R practice can be really helpful if we're interacting with people on online forums, if we are um, a leader in a community organization or a group, if we are working as a therapist or a peer support, or we're supporting um, a loved one or someone that's within our community. So the three R's are resilience, resistance, and reclamation. 
Resilience is the ability to withstand difficulty. Resistance is refusing to lose a sense of self. And reclamation is implementing indigenous ways of being. Um, and it's not, it's not only this three, our perspective is not only connected to indigenous ways of, of being. Why this is important is because sometimes when we think about community um, groups or we think about those we're trying to interact with, there can be difficulties that, that come up. Um, as, a, as a therapist, there are times when people are, are presenting stories, sharing their stories, and, and there's processes that they've been pathologized in many in many ways along their journey in life. This is a way of stepping out of that framework, stepping out of that framework of these are the things that are wrong with you um, and because these are the difficulties that I'm having with you and instead going, oh, well, what am I seeing as these acts of resilience? What am I seeing as acts of resistance and how are you reclaiming your life? So acts of resistance is one that Sometimes we think of resistance as like um, protests and demonstrations in streets, that really active resistance. But that's a very small example of what resistance is. Resistance is um, a way, any way of ref refusing to lose that sense of self. So it may be as somebody who... Um, is trans but is within a community where you're unable to express that of having that one shirt that you wear underneath your other shirt that you just nobody knows about it but that's there it's for you you understand what it means it it keeps you connected to your sense of self um Resilience is, again, that's a whole nother topic that we could talk for hours about. And I'm, I'm just trying to think right now about the pieces that I want to highlight, because I think that it's, it's so important. But I'm also aware of time limitations. So I think what I'm just going to say for resilience at this point is that Resilience is the ability to, to experience adversity, for it to bend you, but not break you. And we all have resilience if we're here, if we're participating in a, in a meeting of the sort, we all have quite strong sense of resilience. The other piece that I want to highlight when thinking about this 3R perspective is that there may be times when we are interacting with individuals that um, maybe we're finding it really difficult to interact with them. Or when we're thinking about critically thinking about who's here, who's not here. Sometimes it's easy to exclude individuals because we've just feel them as difficult individuals. Um, they kind of, maybe they get in our way or they're bringing up things we don't necessarily want to hear or we feel they're too angry or too sad or not willing to participate. And when we encounter individuals that we find difficult, I invite you to step back, use those critical thinking skills through that lens of the three R perspective and go, what elements right now is this person doing that's connected to resilience, resistance, or reclamation? Maybe they're coming to the meeting really fired up and they're wanting to shift everything and they're not able to hear people out within that meeting. Is, there, is this their form 
of resistance? What is it that's, that's bringing them to the table in, in, this, in this way? Um, so with that, I'm going to end with a quote that I, I really love and I think is really appropriate when we are talking so much about um, critical thinking. The quote says, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stel. As you uh, stop sharing your screen, we have a little bit of time yet for some Q and R. And uh, Stel, one of the first questions that came in was, only Indigenous folks should use? And, uh, or can someone say that? That really resonates with me and I would love to adopt that for myself, even though I'm not Indigenous. Sorry, Wendy, you, you paused for a moment, so I didn't actually hear the first part of that question. Sure, sure. Let me repeat it again. So the question is, is Two-Spirit an Indigenous-only term? Or if someone who's not Indigenous says, that really resonates with me, I would like to adopt that for myself, would that be appropriate? Um, no, generally not. Two-Spirit term was, was created, the... the Elder was Myra, I do know her last name, um, I don't have it, uh, La, um, Lararmi, and um, it was at specifically the Indigenous gathering when individuals, it was in the 90s, so if you think of that time, there was a lot of things shifting and happening with um, the AIDS crisis happening, as well as women's rights coming up. Um, there were so many things happening and, and Indigenous folks were saying, yes, this is, there's a movement happening and, and we're not represented in this. And there is something unique about our experiences. Um, and we need to name that and honor that to be able to step outside of colonial ways of being. And it was actually in a dream that came to Myra, this, this term. Um, so yes, I can, I can appreciate that it can resonate with many individuals, but there are other terms that can be used and that can resonate, but it is definitely something that um, it's, yeah, it belongs within Indigenous communities. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, somewhat connected, uh, you mentioned that Two-Spirit has a social and a political element and, and that it's experienced uh, within culture and within language, within different people groups, within indigeneity. And I'm wondering if you can expand on what it means for you personally to be Two-Spirit. How, how is that reflected in your lived reality? Wow, that's a, a really good question and a really large question. I think my experience of, of being a two-spirit person was really, it was a process. It wasn't something that I was like, oh yes, this is, this is who I am who I am, like when I even first was introduced to the concept, it became something that, um, it, it was something that in many ways within the community was presented, continually was presented to me. Um, and I, I feel very connected to the universe and to the energies and to spiritual guidance. And it was this thing that just kept being presented to me. And as I learned more about the history and what it means to be a two-spirit individual, um, I, there are things that I, that I do feel. I feel very connected to um, the spiritual realm. I feel very, very um, 
I'm looking for a word that's not obligated, <laughs> but I feel so deeply connected to other beings around me. And it feels like it's not like when I, in this conversation I was having with an elder the other day, they said, you know, as two spirit people, even if you don't know the term, even if you don't know the experience, you, you feel this inside of you, it's this niggling and, and you just, it's, um, a responsibility. That's the word I'm looking for. I feel this responsibility to, to community and to earth and a responsibility to contributing in, in different ways, as well as um, shining light on things. And I think that that for me is a significant part of being a two spirit person as well as that awareness of having walked in this world it, it, through a binary lens, having been put in that binary and having experiences that are on both sides and all within and outside of that binary really gives a different perspective. Um, and as those experiences began to expand, I, for myself personally, I began to understand why historically there was a value um, put upon people with those experiences. Thank you, Sal. That's a really beautiful embodiment of how, what that means in your life. Now, you also use terms like queer and trans. Can you comment on how those, those identifiers interact and intermingle in your expression of self and also perhaps in your work as an advocate, as someone who speaks at the intersections of these identities? How, how do those all work together and play together? Right. I'm, I, yeah, I usually use the three words, two-spirit, queer, and trans, because they all mean something different to me. Queer, I really connect my identity to as a queer person to my sexuality. Um, I connect trans, I use the term trans because I am somebody who has it engaged in, um, in f different forms of medical transition. And in no way do I believe that you need to engage in medical transition to be a trans person. But for me, um, that's one of the things that kind of separates my transness, not, doesn't separate, but it, it makes it for me when I'm, when I'm communicating with people, an important indicator um, from my two-spirit identity. Um, so I use that term to indicate a different lived experience, that experience of having navigated the world through both experiences in the binary and being put in the binary and not fitting within the binary. And then the two-spirit place is for me very much felt as a, a social and political responsibility. It's something that's, I don't really connect that to my sexuality or my gender identity. It's connected to the ways in which I walk in the world more globally, large, largely. I could just listen to you all night, Stel. You just uh, are, are describing something that, that just seems so rich and beautiful. I wonder, uh, as two-spirit people are uh, reclaiming uh, a, a history and a legacy and a heritage where uh, gender was fully celebrated prior to colonization, what gift do you, gifts, not just gift, but what gifts do you think that will continue to bring to the LGBTQ2S community at large, to the queer community at large, as two spirit people and uh, indigenous queer folks live into this beautiful reality and reclaim it? What gifts can it bring to the larger queer community? Mm, the gift of possibility. That's, there are so many boxes that we have been fed. And I think as indigenous people, 
whether we're two spirit folks or not, I think indigenous ways of life are, are based on, on values of growth and love and healing and responsibility and respect. Um, and those are all things and, and reciprocity um, and interconnectedness. And those are all things that, that create this absolutely beautiful world that comes and goes. And it's not utopia by any stretch of the imagination, but there's, there's this connection with it. There's this sense of, of belonging because we all do belong. We all do bring our own gifts and, and within indigenous ways of being, those gifts are celebrated and important. Um, and it's important. I know in the other presentation I gave that you heard, I talked about the importance that we, we all have a bundle that we are given. And it is so important that we honor our own bundle. And my bundle looks very different than somebody else's bundle. And when we try to mix that up, it just doesn't work with our, with our soul, with the way in which we gain. So my bundle, you know, a significant part of my bundle is um, the ability and willingness to sit with people during really, really hard times. And people all the time say, I could never do what you do. And maybe, maybe they couldn't, but I absolutely love what I do. And it actually feeds my soul, even though it is dark and hard and, and sad. And yes, I need to take time to, you know, nurture myself also, but I can't imagine doing anything else. I can't imagine a, a career change. Like what else would I do? I, it just, it doesn't even fathom somebody else's bundle may be feeding people at gatherings and protests and they may never ever be the person who's in the front line they may never be able to fathom that um but feeding people and nourishing people is so essential and is and is needed and that is something to be honored and yeah so regardless of where you're at regardless of what it is that's a part of your bundle it is all critical and essential i well remember that line in that presentation Stell, when you talked about carry your own bundle and i would imagine that amongst our guests tonight there are some for whom this presentation has been a lot of new knowledge and awareness and language. And there's this incredibly beautiful vision of the indigenous way of life that could bring so much gift to the human race and to all of creation. And there can be this overwhelming sense of but I'm, I'm part of the problem. I'm, I'm a settler. I, I come from a lineage of, of colonizers. Um, for those who are feeling maybe a wee bit overwhelmed and who aren't quite sure what their own bundle is, um, do, you, do you have just not, not a word of um, easy comfort, but just a word of encouragement for those who are maybe feeling a little stirred up right now and, and unsure where to go with that um, can you give just a little more wisdom for perhaps the settlers amongst us who, who need a little bit of wisdom around even figuring out what carrying our own bundle from this point forward? You know, Maya Angelou said, when you know better, you do better. Um, what would you say to, to those folks? Guilt and shame are things that are also connected to colonization and guilt and shame are not going to nurture your gifts they're not going to nurture your your soul and we all do have something to bring to the table and bringing that gift to the table is is a part of your responsibility 
Um, so I think if you're feeling guilt and shame and that's actually causing you to have inaction, then that's, that's counter to, it's counter to what this whole presentation is about. It's counter to what, you know, our, the people, the advocates, the individuals who, who are really um, working on all of the levels, you know, in the front line and, and the caregivers at home nurturing the little babies who are, who are really fighting colonization and trying to decolonize ways of existing. That's counter to all of that. So, um, yeah, we need to, the, the sense of the critical thinking, hold on to that because that's, that's why I included here is that you may be feeling overwhelmed and you may be feeling shame and guilt, but know that those, those are things that um, need to be honored and acknowledged. Like, yeah, this is, this is here but don't allow them to lead to inaction. And that simple inaction of, you know, asking, thinking about it, it is hard to understand what your own bundle is and to, and, and it shifts too. It's not like you're given one bundle at, you know, when you're born and then that's that and you're stuck with it. <laughs> there are, it's, it's organic, it's living, it's moving, it's changing, just like our lives are. Um, so a willingness to even go inward is a, is a contribution to, to our world um, and a beautiful contribution.